Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I feel like messianic implications. In the closing prayer of that psalm, verses 13 through 17, is Psalm 70. Now, it has caused a great amount of discussion, not in interpreting the psalm, but in how this happened. As you know, every age is characterized by the flavor of that age. We could go back to, say, the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Everybody who lived in those period of times was caught up in the philosophy and the flavor of that day as they were in the Renaissance. Now, everybody was permeated by the same kind of, of spirit. Yeah. And beginning during the Renaissance, a critical approach to Bible study began not to build faith, but to treat the book as any other book. And out of this period, a great body of negative criticism about the Bible came. Psalm 70 has been caught in that controversy because this is one of the proof texts for the Psalter not being a book written in time, but a book that has been manipulated and rewritten and uh, edited and re-edited and down through the years. It always amazes me as I read critical scholarship, and the word critical when used in Bible studies is not automatically a negative term. Anybody who, who um, well, even the people who look at the text and try to get back to the best text are called critics. It's not a negative term necessarily. It can be. In this sense, I think it is. Uh, they have tried to use this as a proof for the fact that David didn't write either one of them. And it's all based on presuppositions. It's based on something we don't know. It's based on how this could have happened. Well, you know, we could sit down and think about a lot of ways of how this or that could have happened. <laughs> but we have no, not even one clue as to why or how it did happen. And I think it's the height of ridiculousness to write volumes and volumes about how something could have happened. You know, that's just dumb. All of us could be authors <laughs> in that thing, just sit down and tell how this could have happened, that could have happened. We don't know. There's not one clue as to why this psalm was broken. Some think that it was that David separated it for a special purpose. There are a few word changes, significant word changes. Psalm 40 is a psalm that uses the name Yahweh exclusively. No other name for God appears in Psalm 40 but Yahweh. Now that is uh, the verb to be. It's the, from Yada. It, it's translated various ways. Uh, Exodus chapter 3 is where God revealed that that was his name to Moses. The patriarchs called him El Shaddai, or God Almighty, and did not call him Yahweh. So, that's the name of, that the man called God in Psalm 40. But in the first line of Psalm 70, Yahweh has been changed to Elohim, and that's the word God you see there. The word Yahweh is still in this Psalm 70. Many say, why would he change? Well, now, you know, how many of you are familiar with the JEDP theory of Old Testament origins? Anybody? That is a theory of source criticism based on who wrote the Pentateuch. And it's based on the different names for God and the different types of writing. Uh, J is what is the Yahweh author, uh, E would be the Elohim author, uh, P would be the priestly source, D would be Deuteronomy, and they divide that up. I think it's a good place to say that the word Yahweh and the word Elohim were synonymous enough in the writer's mind of Psalm 40 and Psalm 70 
to interchange them with no theological problems to himself. Now, the word Yahweh and the word Elohim appear in many verses side by side, or at least in the same context and the same phrasing. To me, it is really uh, very poor scholarship to try to find sources by using different names. How many of you use the, name, the same word over and over when you write somebody? Don't you? I was, Joe Dale reads my outlines for me, and uh, sometimes she'll say, you said only four times. Do you want to change one of them? Well, yeah, I don't want to say only four times in one paragraph. Do you? Don't you like to vary your words so it's not so rep re uh, repetitive and boring? The Hebrew writers are the same thing. A beautiful example of that in the Bible is the Gospel of John. He changed it on purpose to make everything a little different. And I think the authors of the Old Testament need to have that kind of freedom without us saying, oh, uh, that's a different author. Well, I just have tremendous problems this particular psalm being used, the proof text, unsupported for views of how the Psalter came into being. And I, I just admit that to you. Now, it says for the choir director, a psalm of David for memorial. Now, the word there for memorial in Hebrew means to remember or remind. Has it uh, surprised you as we went through Paul's epistles recently how many times Paul would say, I want you to remember. I want to bring to mind. Remember through the pastorals again? Call to remembrance, remind. There is something very significant about the biblical writers over and over again call us back to our roots. Not the roots of our old nature, but the roots of our new nature. Remember the day. Remember the way. Remember what happened to you. Remember who you are. Remember what and why you are what you are. And so the Bible has, a, I think, a very meaningful thing to say. Remember back. I will tell you, it'll take a lot of pride out of our lives to remember back where God found us. It'll, it'll bring stability and strength in times of darkness to remember where we've been with the Lord. And so the purpose of this psalm is to remember now, what is the psalmist asked to remember and asking others to remember? He's asking others to remember a very dark day in their lives. This is not a psalm of, let's remember back when it was hallelujah time. This is a psalm, let's remember back when it was the pits. <laughs> you were praying and crying and weeping for God to help you, and you thought he was late, you thought he wasn't on time, you thought he didn't care, and yet he did care. Things worked out. And the, David is calling them back to the dark day, those dark hours, those dark moments in their lives to remember. And so it begins like this. O oh God, hasten to deliver me. Now, how many of you have New American Standard? They call that the Baptist translation now. So many Baptist folks have bought that. Uh, my translation, now mine is the first edition. And they often have changed things. Is your edition have the word hasten in italics? Does it? Now, why? That's a typographical error. The word hasten is in the Masoretic text. And whenever New American Standard italicizes those words, it's trying to say to an English reader, this is not in the Hebrew or not in the Greek text. But this is definitely the word specifically there. And it's mentioned again uh, down in verse 5, the exact same Hebrew word, but it's not italicized in verse 5, so that is a textual error. And if you'll just underline that in your Bible and say in MSS, then you'll know that's not, um, that's, just a, that's just a typing error. And why has nobody picked it up? I don't know. Now, the word uh, deliver is linked to several words through here. Uh, and Hebrew, Hebrew is an ancient language. It's, Greek is a much more developed language. We can be very specific about tenses in Greek. We can be very specific about the background of this word and the, the meaning of this word and the connotation of this word. But Hebrew is not like that at all. One word stands for many things. Uh, the, there's only two tenses in Hebrew. And any one of them can mean past, present, or future. There's <laughs> just no way to really lock them down. Now, in this psalm, there are several different Hebrew words that mean basically the same kind of thing. The word deliver in verse 1, the word help in verse 1, the word salvation in verse 4, the word deliver and help again in verse 5. The word for deliver in verse 1 is different from the word for deliver in verse 5. 
all of them are speaking about this um, this concept that God is not like the deaf, dumb, blind idols that are around the countries that worship nothingness, uh, vanity. But that God is a God that acts and delivers. And when God's children call on him, God does something about it. And so the ideal, not so much of spiritual salvation, which comes in the New Testament through Christ, although uh, the element of spiritual uh, wholeness is not absent from these words, the primary emphasis is physical deliverance, temporal deliverance. You see, the older parts of the Old Testament believe that if God loved you, he'd bless you in this life. Isn't that right? That's what the book of Job is reacting against. So uh, if, you, you know, if, if, God, if you were living a good life, God would bless you. And when things happened bad, uh, God had to rectify it in the here and now because the afterlife for the early Hebrews was a very shadowy thing. Sheol was a, a abysmal concept of you were alive, but you were just a farmer's shade of yourself. Uh, you just walked around mopey. You couldn't praise God. You couldn't sing. There was no hope. And so uh, only as full of revelation came did we understand more of the afterlife and more of the joys and more of the equality and justice that will take place. So here, I think we need to think about that. God, deliver me. Help me. I'm in trouble. I need your help now. You know, I don't need your help after I die. I need your help now is the basic thrust of this. Now, the second phrase, O oh Lord, hasten to help me. Is it, What word for God is this? How do you tell? You tell by the R, don't you, in English. Um, if it's a little R, it's simply the word Adonai that means master. If it's a capital R, what is it? The covenant name for God, Yahweh, that's only used for God's people. It's the name that says, I'll love you, I'll be with you, I am the ever-living God. Okay? O oh Lord, hasten to my help. Now, the word help here is an interesting word. Uh, it's the word Ezra. Ezra. The name of the book and of the, and the man, Ezra. Notice uh, verse 2. Let those be ashamed and humiliated. The word ashamed is a word that, uh, that comes from the concept of to be dry, parched. Um, I really don't know. Uh, there was no way in my resource books to find out exactly the etymology of that word. But knowing the Hebrew mind, to be dry could speak of two things. Because of the great... Uh, need and love for water. It may be connected with the desert mentality and water. Or to know the Hebrew mind about the afterlife and about how important children were, very important. You lived on your children. It may speak of, of the one who is childless some way. But I don't, I'm not sure of that. That's just, that's just a, my own opinion. The word humiliated, remember we're talking about oriental society. This is, the, this is the harshest word to use for what someone could do. To be humiliated and be an oriental man is... We just almost can't imagine our culture what that is to somebody. I, don't even know, I can't even think of any cultural thing that would be as devastating to us unless the IRS audited us or something. That may be close. <laughs> um, Let those be ashamed and humiliated who seek my life, seek my soul, the same thing, uh, trying to kill me, trying to hurt me. Let those be turned back and dishonored. The word turned back here means to fall away. It's used especially for falling away from God. Implication being, they're after me, God, because they don't know you. They're after me because they've gotten away from who you are and your will for men's life. And uh, it's interesting, the word for turn back in verse 2 is not the same Hebrew word as the word turn back in verse 3. And as I look through... Uh, all of the resource books that I have, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to, to know the difference. Uh, both of them talk about turning back to something or being led back to something. Um, I just don't have enough resources to know what the difference exactly is. But it is two different words, and there is some difference. Exactly what it is, I'm not sure. Now, 
In verse 3, in your Bible, does your Bible have, have uh, paragraph marks? This psalm in my Bible is broken into verses 1 to 3 and then 4 and 5. Is that somewhat in yours? Well, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I don't think that's a completely settled question. For I'm not sure that verse 3 is not a positive statement. Matter of fact, my opinion seems to be that verse 3 is a positive statement. Now, it reads in English, Let those be turned back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. <laughs> well, let me uh, retranslate that sentence. Let those be brought back and rewarded of their shame who say, Aha, aha. Now, the word aha to us... Um, we could, we could mean it in derision, couldn't it? Aha, you got yours. Or in Hebrew, it could mean joy. It could mean happiness. Aha, hallelujah. Now, if the word here to turn back means to lead back to God as it can, if it's talking about let those who are led back to God as a reward of their shame say, aha, aha, now, you see how it's changed the whole, the whole purpose of the verse? I want to take verse 3 with 4 and 5. I want to break the paragraph between three and 2 and 3. And I think there's enough uh, background in the Hebrew to do that, especially because the word because there is definitely the word reward. And because the word aha can mean derision or joy, and because the word turn back can very easily mean led back to God. So I think that it could be positive, and uh, it seems to say that to me. Now, verse 4. Let all those who seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. I'd like to make a little theological statement. Nobody that seeks after God has ever been turned away, because God's the one that touched their heart to get them to seek him in the first place. God turns nobody away at the door and says, you're not the right nationality, you're not the right background, you just, uh, you just don't have belonged to the right denomination. Let those who seek thee rejoice and be glad in what you give him. Is that what it says? How often we mix up the gift and the giver. How often we thank God for the blessings and forget to thank God for the greatest blessing, which is a personal relationship with him. How often we pray that God would change circumstance instead of letting us realize that when we pray, we have the greatest privilege in all of the universe, and that is to talk as a child to his father, and the father is no one less than the creator, eternal, ever-living God. He doesn't rejoice in the fact that he got something from God. He's not rejoicing in the fact that God helped him and delivered him. He is rejoicing in the fact that he knows God. Now, the, the second part. And let those who love thy salvation continually say, let God be magnified. The word salvation there is the Hebrew word Isaiah. That's what Isaiah's name means. Salvation. The Hebrew word Isaiah. Um, again, salvation and deliverance are very close here. Let those who love thy salvation. Now, this is another way. The Jews were very nervous about calling God by name, weren't they? That's why they called him Adonai, Lord, instead of Yahweh. They wouldn't pronounce that name. They were afraid of breaking the commandment that says, God will not hold him guiltless who takes the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So they just wouldn't pronounce the name. They thought if they didn't say it, they wouldn't be held accountable. Now, that's, that's legalistic mentality, but that, that fits right in with the parts of the Old Testament. They thought they could just say Yahweh, I mean, say Adonai, and whatever they said, even if it, even if it was something that wasn't appropriate, that God couldn't get them because of the letter of the law, you see. Well, they begin to, that, that began to develop, and suddenly they begin to talk about how they love God's name. They wouldn't even pronounce Adam. They just pronounce, I love thy name, or how they love thy throne, or how they love thy heaven, or how they love thy salvation. These are all Hebrew ways of speaking of how they love the person of God. Now, it, it's saying other things, but it's talking about the person of God. We could let those who love God continually say, let God be magnified. Now, the word magnified just means to be made great. 
to con- to uh, to say and praise, and I would almost want to add, live in such a way that God's name would be glorified, or God would be glorified in us, and in what he does, and in our prayers, and in our attitudes, and on and on. Uh, verse 5, but I am afflicted and needy. I think poor and needy is a King James translation. Now, who wrote this? If the title is correct, and I assume they are, they're pretty ancient. Who wrote it? King David. Would you consider King David poor and needy? I mean, how many donkeys do you have to have before you're rich, right? How many how many wives are you supposed to need? Uh, how many uh, marble buildings are you supposed to have? Well, what is he talking about, poor and needy? Is this a, here again, back, is this a literal thing? Is he poor and needy? Has he been run out of Jerusalem and he just doesn't have any money and he's hungry? And, or is we talking about something on a different plane here? Could it be the Sermon on the Mount kind of thirst and hunger? Could it be the broken spirit and contrite heart of someone who's seeking after God? What do you think? I sure don't know for certain. Does the poor and needy fit in King David? No, it doesn't fit. Is there any other place in the Bible that speaks of hungering and thirsting after righteousness as an attitude to be desired by God in men? Does even Psalms 51, written by David in the darkest hour of his life, say that I would offer sacrifice, but I can't? But what you want is a broken and contrite heart? I think it's, it's a spiritual attitude, not a physical place as far as predicament, physical predicament. Hasten to me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. That that is the Christian's affirmation of faith. We do not look for trust in things or success or circumstances. Our hope is built on nothing less than the person of God in Christ. He is our help not anything else in this world. O oh Lord, do not delay. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt, Lord, have you wound yourself winding watch lately? Have you put another battery in Big Ben? Do you know what's happening to me? Don't you know how late the hour is? God, hey, God, are you awake? you ever felt like that? You ever feel like God just really isn't on time with you and what you ask for? Friend, God has never been late yet. You see, the very fact that we struggle with life builds our faith. It's God's will that we go through some things. It's God's will that we pray to the twelfth hour. And that's not because God is reluctant. That because That is because God's primary goal for us is not success or wealth or health. It's Christ's likeness. And Christ's likeness only comes the way it came to Jesus. And that is, he was perfected by the things that he suffered. Jesus had to go through those things to be all that God the Father wanted him to be. And you're going to have to go through some of those dark nights wondering, does God hear? Knowing that God hears and wondering, God, I guess my time's just not your time, but knowing that God's never been like this. Okay, questions or comments? Oh Lord, help us when we pray to trust in you and not in the repetition or power or beauty of our own words. God, help us not to whistle in the dark, but stand with arms raised waiting for you. Thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to struggle with who we are and who you are. Thank you that knowing you is not a static thing, but a dynamic, ongoing, growing thing. Thank you for being concerned about who we are and not just what we have. Oh, Lord, thank you for being there when we need you. 
Oh, Lord, thank you that we know you and that you've provided a place for us and that you're going to send your son to come back and get us. Help us, Lord, to live by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.